Now that we've looked at doing hypothesis tests, uh, measuring single means and proportions in populations, now we're also going to look at how we can uh, run hypothesis tests for uh, comparing two different means within a population and seeing if we have a relationship between them. <coughs> Up until now, our focus has been on a single variable such as a population mean or a proportion p. In this section we're going to focus on inferences between two or more variables within a population. So just an idea of, of what we're doing picture wise. Uh, if this big circle represents our population of inter interest, uh, our question is are x and y related in some way? And so we take two samples from our population and uh, we collect our data, we analyze it, and then based on the observed data, the question, do we have a significant evidence that X and Y are related, is answered. In the remaining modules, we're going to explore three key relationships. Um, we are going to explore whether two categorical uh, set of values are related, whether a categorical uh, is having an impact upon a quantitative uh, measurement. And finally, we will look at um, examining relationships between two variables that are both quantitative. <coughs> uh, so the main things we're going to look at from this point out um, is the CC, CQ, and QQ relationships. Um, where our explanatory variable, variable for two of these at least will be categorical, but then the response variable will both be categorical and quantitative. Within each of the inferential methods, we'll focus on when the inferential, infer, inferential method is appropriate for use, second, under what conditions the procedure can be safely used, the conceptual idea behind the test as it's usually captured by the test statistic and also how to use software to carry out the procedure in order to get the p-value of our test <coughs> and of course once we've obtained that p-value we want to be able to interpret the results uh, in the context of the problem that we're looking at so of those methods we're first or those scenarios we're first going to examine the categorical quantitative uh, relationship this is when we have a categorical, which remember tends to be a non-numerical explanatory variable, and a quantitative, which is a counter measurement response variable. And so our general idea is here's our population and our question is, is there a relationship between uh, X and Y? And so we divide our population into two different subpopulations uh, based on some sort of category. There's our categorical explanatory variable right there. This division here represents that. And then from these two populations, we calculate our mean, mu1 and mu2. And um, we're going to want to see whether the um, categorical uh, division of our population has an impact on the outcome of our mu for both relationships. Now there's two different types of population means using two different scenarios. <coughs> One is where we have two samples that are independent and the other we call dependent. And here's a picture to kind of give you an idea of what we're talking about here. When we have independent samples, we are pulling our uh, samples from two distinct populations and in this case, these represent two different uh, groups of people. The two groups are not the same, and so we say they're independent. In a dependent scenario, we divide our population by some sort of characteristic, categorical characteristic, and then we pull our sample from those different things. However, these two samples actually represent the same group. Um, they're usually either the same persons uh, but with a different um, 
kind of scenario over here than we had over here. <coughs> or a lot of times experiments will be done with identical twins that have the same genetic makeup and that type of thing. So in to break it down here, our independent samples are really representing two different groups of people, whereas our matched pairs example, um, we're actually matching up pairs of the same person or people with uh, very close or exact genetic matches. We're first going to look in 13.1 at how we would run a test with independent samples. Um, so let's let's take a look at a more exact um, rendering of this so we can get an idea of what we're talking about in independent samples. So in this example we want to measure the effects that moderate drinking two beers has on driving. So we take two different random samples of people. One group is given no beer and then asked to navigate an obstacle course. And the second group is given two beers and asked to do the same. And then their reaction times to various obstacles are measured. So in this case, we have two very different groups. Um, in this group, you can see we have 10 people. And in this group, we have nine people. So they don't even have to have the same sample size. Um, these, this group of people is given no beer, this is given two beers, so that's our uh, quanti uh, categorical division between the two groups. And we want to see whether this division of alcohol intake has an effect upon their reaction times to the obstacles. So two different groups of people randomly selected and independent of each other. We could do the same experiment Except in a dependent scenario, we would take the same person, have them run the obstacle course before drinking two beers, and then have the same person after two beers run the same obstacle course um, and compare the reaction times. And this is an example of a dependent where we've made matched pairs because we're not dealing with different people. Here we avoid the idea, the uh, objections that might uh, be like, well, it's possible that uh, you know, the people with two beers were just worse drivers, right, if we're talking about two separate populations. And so by matching it up with the same person, we're avoiding that sort of uh, accusation. <coughs> so in a dependent sample, we have the same group of randomly selected individuals, uh, but the reaction times are taken in a before and after scenario. Uh, this might also uh, apply in a pre-test, post-test scenario for someone who's gone through a class, uh, that type of thing. We handle these very differently. Um, however, when we're doing uh, two means and we're dealing with independent populations, there are several ways that we set up our hypotheses. The null hypothesis assumes that there will be no difference between the two populations. And so we can always write our uh, null hypothesis in a similar way. Uh, going back to the um, beer scenario, we could say that group one with no beer will have the same reaction time, average reaction time, as group two after two beers. Another way to write this, of course, would be to say that their difference is zero. If they're both the same number, if we subtract them, we get zero as a result. The alternative hypothesis assumes that there are differences in the populations. And so we choose from either A, uh, where the first group is less than the second group, B, uh, the first group is greater than the second group, or just C, that uh, they're different. And of course, we build these based on the wording of the question. So let's look a couple of examples. Before we do that, <laughs> sorry, I got a little ahead of myself there. Uh, the two sample t-tests, we can be used safely as long as the following conditions are met. So here's some preamble for us. Uh, first of all, the two samples are indeed independent, assuming that. And when we are in one of the following two scenarios, number one, both populations are normal, or more specifically, the distribution of the response variables in both populations is normal. Notice that in my response, I'm actually dealing with numbers, so we can really talk about normality. And both samples are random, or at least can be considered as such. 
or um, if we don't know about the distribution of the original variable, the populations are known or discovered not to be normal, but the sample size of each random sample is large enough. In other words, it's greater than 30. Given these two conditions are met, we can run a two-sample t-test for our independent samples. So here's our first example, and if you have a calculator, um, I suggest you grab it. And I'm going to do the same thing here. Um, and unfortunately, it's going to uh, throw this off, but that's OK. Um, so we're going to have to share the screen uh, with my calculator. So follow along with me, and you can always look back um, at the presentation in the order it was meant to go. Um, See if I can snap this over here. Yep, I'm going to need to get it a little bit bigger. All right, so here's our question. Uh, the question is Do men frequent malls less than women? So we took 70 men and 60 women and asked how many times they frequented the mall last month. The men had a mean of 2.3 and a standard deviation of 1.5. The women's mean was 3.4, and their standard deviation was 2.8. Test this hypothesis with a significance level of 0 0.05. All right, so again, with our null hypothesis, we are assuming that, they, that there's no difference, uh, that men and women frequent the malls on average the same uh, time, same average number of times per month. And then the alternative is Here's our question. Do men frequent malls less than women? So we would say men, the average uh, number of times, is less than the average number of times for women. All right, on your calculators, we are going to run what's called a two-sample t-test. And this can be found under stat. Go over to your tests, and then choice uh, number four right there. So I'm just going to hit four. And in this case, we are not actually inputting data. We're actually inputting stats. So I would highlight stats. Um, if we were actually inputting data, we would be putting the individual data values into our lists in the list function. But here we're actually giving the results, so we don't have to do that. And so you can see we have x1, uh, x bar 1, standard deviation 1, and n1. We're going to put the men in this one. So in the first case, uh, the first average for men was 2.3. And then the standard deviation for the men was 2.8. I'll put that in there. And then the men uh, were sampled. There, there were 70 of them. And so we put in 70 for men. For the women, uh, they had a mean number of times as 3.4. Uh, the standard deviation was 2.8. Actually, I think I put the wrong standard deviation in for men. I looked at the wrong number here. The standard deviation for men was uh, rather 1.5. So I'm going to go back up here and fix that. And then for this test, we are doing a left tail test, men less than women. Uh, my group one here that I put less than group two, so we're going to hit enter over the less than group two symbol. And then in this case, uh, we are not going to pool our results. So just hit no on the pool, though there will be times that you will, and we'll get to that here in a minute. All right, then we're going to calculate. Oops, and I have an error in my domain. Okay, so let's go back to that. I'm going to see if I can figure it out. I've got to quit first. And I probably just put some weird thing in there, and maybe some of you caught that. So I always like to keep these mistakes here on. Oops, I went the wrong choice. Let's try that again. And highlight test, choice number four. Stats 2.3, 1 1.5, 70, 3.4, 2.8. Oops. We put n as our zero. I forgot to put 60 
equal the number of women. So that was that was one my problem there. <coughs> I forgot my n. All right, so we'll try this again. Again, not pulling, and we'll calculate. All right, and so we see a few things here. The t is our test statistic value, and then the value below it is our p value. So you can see with our test statistic value, we were negative 2.726 standard deviations to the left, and then the area to the left of that value was 0 0.0038. And the degrees of freedom I'm using here are 87. <coughs> so um, let me go through this here. As you were doing it, um, we used our calculators to perform this. We went stat and then highlighted test, choice number four, two sample t-test. We entered our given data and we hit calculate and we did not pool in this scenario. <coughs> now we interpret the results with the given level significance. Uh, our p-value was 0 .0039 if I round it to four decimal places. And with my significance level being 0 0.05, means that my p-value, my probability, was less than 5%. Um, and so the conclusion for this is we are going to reject the null hypothesis. With a p-value that's lower than my significance level, that means there is significant evidence to support the conclusion uh, that, the mean, that the men frequented the mall less than women at the 5% significance level. Now, I do want to pull out a note here that I've uh, indicated and that is on your ho homework, as you're going through the four problems that we have here, um, follow the directions that are written in the homework as to when to pool and when not to pool the results. And then secondly, you want to also follow directions on how the p-value is determined for that problem. At times, it will differ from the p-value given in the two-variable two t-test. For the most part, your test statistic will always be spot on but the p-value will sometimes be different. And sometimes what is required is that you just go to TCDF and calculate the p-value that way um, with, and I also give you instructions on how to do the degrees of freedom there. Uh, the problem with the degrees of freedom is we have two different sample sizes. And so the question becomes, which one do we use? And uh, I will give you directions on that in the homework. Looking at another example, see if you can walk through and do this on your calculator with me. I'm not going to uh, bring my calculator out this time. But here, is there a difference in LDL levels between vegetarians and those on medication? 55 vegetarians are selected with the mean LDL levels are measured to be 118 with a standard deviation of 25. 50 people on medication were found to have a mean LDL level of 109 with a standard deviation of 20. Use a significance level of 0 0.01. So in this case, we know, of course, the null hypothesis is that there is no difference between vegetarians and uh, people on a selected medication. Um, and the question is, is there a difference? They don't really tell us whether they think one is less than the other. They just say difference. So our alternative is that there is no difference or I'm sorry, there is a difference that they're not equal um, for our alternative. So we're going to, again, perform a t-test at our given level of significance. So we're going to go stats test number four again, enter our given calculate, and do not pool on this particular problem. Go ahead and pause the video while you put this in. Checking your answers now, we interpret the results in the p-value with our given significance level. We see our p-value is 0 0.0434, which is uh, greater than 0 0.01. I, that's the typo right there that I just noticed. That is greater than 0 0.01. And so interpreting our results based on the parameters of the problem, we would say that we would have to fail to reject our p-value was greater than 0 0.01. Again, cross that out, put a greater than symbol. We would say there is insufficient evidence then to support the conclusion at the 0 0.01 significance level that there is a difference of LDL levels between vegetarians and those on medication. This concludes our lesson for Module 13.1.